Good morning and welcome to Little Rock Original Free Will Baptist Church. I'm Jerry Godwin and I'll be bringing the uh, Sunday School lesson to you today. And the lesson entitled is Recognition. And we should be need to recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior that he is. And the scripture for the day is taken from Luke chapter 13 verses 22 through 35 and that's Luke chapter 13 verses 20 through 22 through 35 and as we begin the lesson and we go to the Lord in prayer please have please have um, situations that you want to pray about persons that you'd like to pray for and and we'll have a pause in the prayer we do thank you with the bottom of our hearts for your continued uh, service and, and, and coming online and listening to the service. As a matter of fact, in fact, the day is a monumental day. Today is 100, 104 consecutive weeks that we've been online, which equates to 52 weeks a year is two years. Two years that we have been online and we have been truly blessed with your um, attendance and and we appreciate it and please please tell others about this lesson if you've been blessed and reach out to other people um, God bless you and, and we appreciate it let's go to the Lord in prayer our Heavenly Father we pray from Psalm 27 you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall I fear? We should fear no one or no situation. The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Lord, we know with our faithfulness to you and your love for us that we should not be afraid of any situations. And Lord, we seem to have so many in this 21st century and in the last couple of year, years. One thing I ask of you, Lord, is that what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that I will be close to you, that I will learn from you, and I will feel your love, be aware of your love and of your grace and your mercy. Teach us your way, Lord, and Lead me in a straight path. Lord, we all have a tendency to wander, either stray from you, and which is a sin, or, Lord, we, our minds um, stray, and we forget to focus on you and your love and your scripture. Lord, forgive us of our shortcomings that we might strive to be whom you that you would have us to be, and Lord, we all have on our hearts right now situations and persons in our lives that we want to lift up to you right now. And Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear the prayers of those names that have been mentioned, those situations that have been mentioned, and Lord, even those that do not know what to pray at this moment, Lord, we know that their effort in prayer, that the Holy Spirit will intercede and lift these situations up and interpret um, the words that are intended. Father, we thank you, we praise your name for this opportunity and this privilege to teach the word of God and to reach out to those within this church, but also, Lord, those that are outside these walls throughout this, this um, county, this town, this state, and even beyond throughout the United States and perhaps even to the countries of the world. 
Lord, we know that the situations in the world today, we know that people uh, need to um, hear the word of God and those that know the word of God, Lord, that they might be peacemakers, not only reaching out to others to bring world peace, but the conflicts that we all have within our own lives that tr are troubling to us. Help us to live a life, a life of shalom, a life, life of peace, that even in the midst of conflict, that we might share the love and grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in, whom, in whose name we pray. Amen. Woo! I'm, <laughs> uh, you, you might not be able to tell, but this is the first time I've actually brought the, the um, lesson at 7 p.m. This is uh, on, a, on a, I think it's Thursday night, isn't it? You know, Thursday night, and I, I'm, I'm excited, and I'm wound up, and I hope that you are, and as you read this scripture, along with me. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. And why is he going to Jerusalem? Okay, it's now Lent, moving toward Easter Sunday. Okay, so test. Why is he going to Jerusalem? He has known for some time that his mission in this life is to die for our sins. And he is going toward Jerusalem to meet that destination. Now, as he's doing that, he's teaching and healing um, uh, the sick and, and performing miracles. And he's been doing this for some time. Now, the, the hearers then, just like the hearers today, have to decide who this person Jesus is. And that is the purpose of the Gospels. And as a matter of fact, the entire Bible is to decide in our lives who Jesus is. Was he a great man? Was he a great prophet? Yes. But is he more than that? Yes. He is our Savior who has died for us. And we have to make that determination, each one of us, Every single one, you can't decide for your spouse. You can't decide for your children, nor can they decide for you. That's a decision that all of us, during this lifetime, our lives, that we decide who Jesus is. Now, beginning in, we're in chapter 13. Now, this pilgrimage of Jesus begins in Luke chapter 9, and it goes through Luke chapter 19. That's a lot of scripture and a lot of Bible and a lot of this one gospel to get him on the way to Jerusalem to the cross and to the resurrection. It's recorded beginning in verse 13. Jesus went through one town and village after another teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Lord, will only a few be saved? Now, as I said to begin with, Jesus was going to all these towns and preaching and teaching on his way to his final destination here on earth and it says someone asked him Lord will only a few be saved that's like going to a meeting in church and someone tells the preacher uh, preacher some people are saying blah 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 when many times it's the individual themselves that's saying it but they just want to lay the blame on someone else so they're saying some say that only a few will be saved. For you that study the scripture, I know this is going to be a shock to you, 
Right? The point is, is that these, some are trying to trick Jesus. Now, the Jews, primarily who he was talking to at this time, um, many of them are, believed that all the Jews would be saved because they were the chosen people of God. And some believed that the Gentiles, meaning those that were not Jewish, of other nationalities, none of them would be saved. And that's the way the Jew Jews lived in the Old Testament, continuing into the New Testament, believing that they had a higher uh, religion and faith than anybody else did. Do not make that mistake. We still make that mistake in the 21st century. Sometimes we take the holier than thou pious attitude of saying, look at us. We are good Christian people. Like someone said, there's no such thing as a not good Christian person. But sometimes we are. And there's no such thing as a not a good Christian person. So here they're trying to trick Jesus. Now, Negatively, salvation means being saved from eternal separation of God. And someone told me one time, that's the greatest definition of hell, is to be eternally separated from God. You can be living in this world, this time, in the present time, and never commit in your life to Jesus Christ. And you may be in that number. You may have never committed yourself to Jesus Christ and believe that he is the Son of God. You have already begun your separation from God. On the other hand, positively, salvation is um, eternal fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, and he has saved you, you are saved, you have already begun eternity with him now. And that transition will happen when you die or Jesus returns to have eternity with, with you. A present experience that requires a saved person to live like a saved person. We, and, and you know it, you, you know it, that so many times we live in the church as someone, oh me, oh my. You remember the cartoon? Um, I can't remember what his name was. Droopy. That was the one, the little dog. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my. We have, oh, it's what? We shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be one that is eternally happy and grateful. And we all have bad times. We are having bad times right now. They're having bad times in the Ukraine. Terrible times. We, none of us want to experience that. But there are Christians in Ukraine today that are professing Christ as their Savior, and that's what they are depending on. And we, too, in America, right here in America, right in America, we should be proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ to all of those around us to hear about our Savior. Now, here is, in, in, this, in this first scriptures, is the, uh, there's a book I would recommend, not many books I recommend, but this one I highly recommend to a lot of people. It's called The Will of God by Dr. Leslie Weatherhead. Now, we want to see this first one. There's, he says there's one will, but broken into three categories. The intentional will of God. What is the intentional will of God? It is that all men might be saved. And in 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verses 4, he said, Who God who desires 
all men to be saved and to come to fellowship and to the knowledge of the truth. God desires who will be saved? All who profess him as Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 1 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Someone asked Jesus, what, may, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, believe and you will be saved. Confess your sins and profess to follow Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus continued, and I'm sure the hearers wish that he hadn't. So many times when they ask Jesus a question, he's going to either go ask them a question or he's going to tell them a parable. Now, what is a parable? Um, a parable, the most common definition, is an earthly, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He tells it so that the people, the most simple story, can understand what he's saying. But then a day or two later, a while, and they're going, man, I wish he hadn't said that. Man, he really told us. He really told us the truth, and I have to do something with it. I have to accept it and reject it. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Now, the word strive, I mentioned in my prayer, that's a strong word to me. Um, the word strive um, means to be focused, and the intent there is, is to learn more about Jesus Christ. We have, Paul said it this way, to it's a military term, and if you can ask a military, ex-military person to press towards the mark of the high calling, which is Christ Jesus. To press means to block out all this other stuff and move focused to a life with Jesus Christ. Now, here's the deal. Um, uh, an illustration I used many times is the simple uh, communication model. You have in this box, you have the source, which is God and Jesus Christ. And in the middle is a box that is the message. And Jesus is trying to send that message to us. And the last box is the receiver. And that's us. Between Jesus and the message and the message and us, Many times there's noise, and noise don't mean a loud noise. It can just be a distraction that keeps us from striving to hear that message. Now, um, a communication model is not complete until that receiver sends feedback to the source to complete the loop. That feedback is either accepting or rejecting the message of Jesus Christ. Now he says, for us to strive. And he, then he says this parable. When once the owner of the house, and the owner, I'll give you an insight here, the owner is Jesus Christ. The owner of the house has gone up and shut the door. And you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. And then in reply, he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evil doers. Now, this is akin and very much like the parable of the ten virgins, where there was five that prepared for the bridegroom to come and five didn't. And um, 
the, the five that didn't, didn't have any oil in the lamps. And the bridegroom came at midnight, and they went to the banquet and left the five behind. Here we see all these people that have seen and heard Jesus. Now here's the warning, or you can take it, let's say, this, here's the opportunity. We as a church have heard the story of Jesus many, many, many times. I personally, and I use a personal illustration, I heard, I don't remember coming to church. I was, a, I was an infant, a child. And I heard the gospel message time after time, Sunday after Sunday, year after year. And it was just a few weeks short of my 18th birthday that I accepted Jesus as my Savior. There's been others that have waited for years and years and have heard the message. He's declaring to them, I've told you, and you have heard. They said, we have heard you. He says, um, I don't know who you are. The door, knocking at the door. Um, Don, you can't believe this, but one of the commentaries mentioned this song. I heard you knocking, but you can't come in. And I decided not to use that, but here I did. Uh, an old song from, I guess, the 70s. But anyway, I heard you knocking, but you have had the opportunity all this time. And he says, those that I turn away, they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping. This is not getting cheery-eyed. This is not crying. Weeping, when Jesus mentions it in the Bible, is a sobbing and a sorrow that the opportunity has passed. Remember what I said before? This is, is, is an eternal separation from God. And not only that, he's speaking to the Jews. And listen to this. Jesus says, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves are thrown out. You, the, the patriarchs often mentioned in the Bible in the New Testament referring to the Old Testament is Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. It's a father, son, and grandson. Abraham, Isaac, and, and um, Abraham, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm sorry, and the prophets in the kingdom of God. Then people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will eat in the kingdom of God. Whoa, here he's, he's blowing the mind. He's saying, you as a Jew, you as my called people, you think that you have a right to the kingdom of God but the people from the north and the south and the east and the west, who are they? They are the Gentiles. And he goes on and says, uh, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. And um, uh, this is the, the um, I can't remember the word right now. I'm sorry, went blank. But anyway, he doesn't say all that's first will be last. He says some. And he doesn't say all that will be first will be last, but some. Some of you that are listening, some of you that have been so narrow-minded in the focus, and from the very beginning, I called Abraham and Jacob and Isaac to not only lead the people of Israel to me, but to, re to, to, to gather all the people around to the kingdom of God. And he says that's going to happen. Now, this is the second will of God. The circumstantial will of God is that 
He intended that all men might be saved, but because of the circumstances, he's going to go to Jerusalem and is going to have to die for the sins of others. And then he, in verse 31 to 35, he says, At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, there's some discrepancy here because the original context says, um, manuscripts say, say something, I'll explain in just a second. Because we all know who have studied the scripture is that the Pharisees very seldom did anything for Christ's good. They were always trying to entrap him. And they said, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. And the original manuscript says, go tell that fox and this fox. And that makes more sense because the Pharisees were foxes also. They were sly, sly, uh, conniving, deceitful. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound like Satan? Yes. They were doing the work of Satan. And he says, listen, May, meaning to pay attention and be obedient to his will. I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside Jerusalem. And they did kill prophets inside Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it, how often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. He cried as he came into Jerusalem, and he cried that they had wept because they had rejected him. And he said, I desire, God desired that all men might be saved. He desired as a mother hen would gather her brood under the wings. That's his desire. But then he says, this house, the temple, Jerusalem is going to be left to you. And he says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's the third will of God. The intentional will is all men might be saved. The, in, the circumstantial will is that he has to die for our sins. The third will of God is the ultimate will of God. God's will will be done. God's will will be done. In the end, not only when he comes into Jerusalem and he'll be resurrected, but also in the second advent, of Jesus Christ where he comes again to claim all of those who believe in him. Praise be to God that his will will be ultimately done. Now, this lesson tells us that on the courage of Jesus to take that pilgrimage, the commitment to God's will, Jesus said in, on the cross, not my will, but thine be done in the Garden of Gethsemane and the compassion that he had for all of us, that the salvation is there for all who receive him. Hear this blessing in conclusion. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now 
and forevermore. Amen.